Section 5.5, five, uh, we're going to start talking about complex numbers and roots. And really, what we're looking at here is this section really builds off of what we did as far as completing the square and solving using square roots. Now, I don't know, to be honest with you, how much that you talked about complex numbers and roots in Algebra 1, so this might be a little bit new, but it is relatively straightforward and to the point. Um, so it should make you know a decent amount of sense as we go through this here. Now, uh, what we're looking at to start with is first we have to talk about what an imaginary number is, how that applies to complex numbers, and then once we get all of that taken care of, uh, as far as determining the difference between the two and how they work together, then we're going to look at how we solve quadratic equations that involve complex roots. All right, so there's a lot of different things here uh, that you're going to hear that you might not necessarily have heard before in the past. Okay, first we're going to talk about imaginary units, um, imaginary numbers, complex numbers, um, what the real part of a complex number is, what the imaginary part of a complex number is, and then also what the complex conjugate is. All right, now. Um, these definitions, you know, it's something that you're going to write down in your notes here, and you might not have a very good idea what's going on right now, but as we go through the video, uh, you should be able to pick up some of that stuff as we go. All right, now, the first thing we're going to talk about is, we're going to kind of flash back here for a second, and we're going to think about when we were solving quadratic equations or finding their zeros, what we were actually finding. And if you remember, Basically, we talked about when we were solving quadratic equations or finding their zeros or their roots, what we were actually finding was the points at which the parabola or the graph of the quadratic function crossed the x-axis, or basically the points where I would have an output value of zero. Okay, No output as far as the y or the y being equal to zero, and that's what it represented. Now, if you look down here in the bottom right corner, uh, what you'll notice is a quadratic equation, quadratic function, um, but you will notice how it doesn't intersect the x-axis. So what that means is that particular function here has no real roots, okay, or we can't say, you know, the roots are x equals 2 or x equals negative 3, all right? It has no x-intercepts, therefore it has no real roots, all right? Now that doesn't mean it doesn't have roots, but they are what we refer to as um, complex roots. Okay, or uh, are based on imaginary numbers. So if you look at this particular function that we're given, if you were to take that, oops, if you were to take that and set it equal to zero, all right, and this goes back to what we talked about, we would subtract the one over, and we would get x squared equals negative one. Now we all know if we were to go ahead and take the square roots of those, we'd end up with the square root of negative one on the other side. All right. Up until this point, we basically talked about that's not possible. However, by defining the square root of negative 1, like it says down here, we arrive at what's referred to as imaginary units or a imaginary unit. Okay, So in this case, the imaginary unit is just defined as the square root of negative 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about how we can kind of manipulate things a little bit and basically name something or designate something to represent the square root of negative one. So we can kind of keep moving forward um, with something that is going to look like this right here, okay, where we can get that negative out from underneath the radical and we can keep moving forward. All right, so what we have is an imaginary number, okay, an imaginary number occurs or happens anytime we try to take the square root of a negative number. All right. Now, like we talked about before, as far as the imaginary unit, this is kind of our base or what we start with. All right. The square root of negative 1 is referred to as our imaginary unit. All right. We are going to call that or designate that by the letter i. Okay. i is going to represent the square root of negative 1. So what's going to happen here is anytime I have a negative under a square root, essentially I'm going to rewrite things. 
to say, well, I actually have the square root of negative 1 times whatever that number, other number was under the square root. And now I can rewrite things with an i out in front. So basically now the number that is left underneath the radical is a real number without a negative. Okay, well, if it doesn't have a negative, I can now work with it in the same way that I've worked with every other um, radical that we talked about with completing the square and solving using square roots. All right. The other thing you're going to want to take from this particular um, slide is the fact that if I go ahead and I square i, like is written down here at the bottom, I end up with whatever number happens to be under that particular radical. Okay, so if I take i and we know that i is equal to the square root of negative 1, if I square i, or essentially square both sides, all right, i squared is equal to negative 1. All right, so that's something else that as we move forward uh, later in the chapter, we're going to talk more about operations with complex numbers, but how we can use i squared to our advantage. All right, so for right now, um, we're just going to kind of focus on the whole idea of if we have a negative number or a square root, essentially we will rewrite it uh, by pulling that square root of negative 1 out or separating it and calling that i. So I will no longer have um, a negative number underneath the square root. So we're just going to start simple here. Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on this part that's underneath the square root. So I'm not going to do anything with the 5 right now. All right, but what I am going to do is I'm just going to kind of write this all as multiplication. All right, so what I've done is I've essentially separated the negative from the 121 that's under the radical. All right, well, we just talked about the square root of negative 1 is equal to i. Okay? And I kind of draw my eyes with a goofy little, the kind of italicized with a little hook at the bottom. Um, you don't have to do it that way, just the way that I've always done it. So now if i is supposed to equal the square root of negative 1, essentially what I have here is 5i times the square root of 121. All right. And the square root of 121 is actually 11. So I have 5i times 11, which essentially gives me 55i. All right. Now, there's a couple different, you know, ways you could go about doing this as far as the order in which you perform all these operations. The first thing I like to do is for sure get that negative out of there, which essentially just results in writing an i out in front of your radical. If you realize that your radical is a perfect square, or the number that's left under the radical is a perfect square, you can kind of combine that all into one step. Uh, you don't have to draw it out like I did in multiple steps, but I'm just trying to get across to you what this looks like if you were to do it step by step, not to mention the fact that um, you can kind of see what I'm doing as opposed to me just writing random numbers up there without you, you know, realizing what's going on. All right, now in this case, remember if I have a negative out front, that really doesn't affect anything, but it's like having a negative 1 there. So I'm just going to kind of rewrite everything. I'm going to take that square root of negative 1 out. And I'm going to be left with the square root of 96 right there. All right, so basically what happens is this part right here becomes i. I take the i times the negative 1, so I have negative i squared to 96. All right, now 96 is not a perfect square, but there are perfect squares that go into 96. All right, so what I'm looking at or looking for here is um, do I have numbers like 4 or, you know, something bigger than 4 even, like maybe 16, uh, that could go in there. Now, 4 does go in there uh, 24 times. But 16 also goes in there 6 times, and that's going to be a little bit easier to work with. So negative i, and I'm going to split up this square root of 96. So I'm going to say the square root of 16 times the square root of 6 um, would actually get me back to 96. All right. Now if you use 4 and 24, that would be fine. Uh, the problem is you're still going to have to break down. Um, you know, if I did the square root of 4 times the square root of 24 to kind of break down 96, um, I would get 2 squared of 24, but then I would have to go forward again, and I would have to break down the 24 and end up getting, you know, 4 squared of 6. All right, whereas if I take the bigger number that goes into it like I did here, all right, 16 is going to be 4, so I take that 4 times the negative i and get negative 4i squared of 6. All right, so up here I would have got the same thing because of that negative i that's involved but it would have just taken a little bit longer to make that step. 
All right, so really, you know, like I said, we're building off of what we did in uh, section four with completing the square. Now uh, we've kind of opened up more possibilities as to the problems that we can solve because we can now work with negative numbers underneath radicals. So that's what we're going to start with today. So you're just going to have some expressions that involve radicals and negative numbers underneath those radicals. And you're going to have to show how you can use the whole concept of the imaginary unit and I. Um, to create uh, numbers that have negatives in them or negative roots. Okay, so now moving forward, we're going to take it one step uh, further and we're actually going to solve these problems. So this looks very similar to what we kind of started with in section four with completing the square, where we weren't really completing the square, but we were using the whole square root property to solve things. So if I look at what I have here, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to square root both sides. Okay, I have the squared term isolated. Uh, now I can go ahead and get rid of that power of 2 by square rooting. So I'm going to end up with x. And now remember, because we are solving something, we have to include the plus or minus sign. All right. Now, what we're looking at here is the square root of 144. Well, I'll get there in a second. All right. So what I really have here is I have to go ahead and take out that negative. So instead of, you know, we've already talked about really I have, you know, the square root of negative 1 and 144. So I'm just going to take this and basically I'm going to start thinking about if I have a negative underneath, that basically translates into I'm going to have to write an i out front. All right, so I'm going step by step here. All right. Now, basically what we're working with is I can take the square root of 144, so I have plus or minus 12i as my answer. Okay, so I have an imaginary number as my solution to this. Okay, imaginary number because it includes an i with it. All right, so plus or minus 12i. And again, what this means is if you were to graph, um, you know, x squared plus 144, if we were to actually write it in standard form, all right, you're going to have a parabola, but it's not going to intersect the x axis anymore. All right, now, moving along to the next part here, same idea, all right, but what I have to do here is um, I kind of add in an extra step, all right, so I can't factor anything, and again, we talked about your first thought process should always be can I factor, because that's really the easiest way to do something, all right, I can't because the only thing we talked about that can be factored with two terms is a difference of two squares, and I certainly don't have that here, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract 90, over to the other side, and I'm going to use the square root property to solve again. All right, I have a squared term, and I have a constant. So that means because I don't have just that x term or that b term in there, um, I can go ahead and just use square roots to solve. So now I'm going to isolate the squared term. Uh, so I need to divide by 5. And I'm going to take negative 90, and I'm going to divide it by 5, and I'm going to get negative 18. Okay. So negative 18, um, the next step moving forward would be to square root both sides. So x for right now is going to equal plus or minus the square root of negative 18. All right, now we talked about because I have a negative underneath, that means technically I would split things into the square root of negative 1 times the square root of 18. But to kind of simplify things a little bit, I'm basically just going to say, well, x equals plus or minus i square root of 18. Okay, and just remember the i represents the square root of negative 1. So you have a negative inside or under your radical. Basically, that just means write an i out front to represent the square root of negative 1 or make the 18 something I can deal with. Now, perfect squares that go into 18, I could have the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. So what I'm going to end up with is an imaginary solution uh, where I end up getting 3 out of this part, take it times the i, and then I leave the square root of 2. All right? So again, I have an imaginary solution, which means I have no x-intercepts, or my graph would not intersect the x-axis in any place. All right, now hopefully you've been kind of keeping up and taking notes on that. I haven't left a whole lot of problems for you to work on uh, on your own with that particular portion of the assignment, just because it really is the same thing that you've been doing uh, in section four with completing the square. Now we're just throwing in that imaginary concept. So if you get the idea of the square root of negative 1 equaling i, you should be able to kind of take things and put them together. All right.
So the last couple of problems, your answers have been imaginary, all right? Or in other words, you've basically just been dealing with a number and i, okay? Or a number, i, and a radical, which essentially is still just a number, all right? Now what we're going to do when we actually start completing the square, uh, or using the whole idea of imaginary units when we complete the square, is our answers are going to look a little bit more like what's in the top of this box up here, where we have a real part, like the threes and the fours here, and we also have an imaginary part, which would be represented by the parts that contain i's. When you take a real number and an imaginary number and you put them together, you have what's called a complex number. All right. So a complex number, we always write in this form, okay, which we write the real part first, followed by the imaginary part, okay, where A and B in that case just represent numbers. All right. And uh, we call them complex numbers. Okay, real part, imaginary part, put them together. Okay. And it's relatively, you know, sounds simplistic, but it is pretty easy. All right. You take the real number part or the part that doesn't have an I and you put it in front of or you're adding it or subtracting it to or from the part that actually does have an I or the imaginary part. All right. So basically what we're going to do is we're going to kind of take this idea and again, we're going to build off what we talked about the other day. We're going to complete the square. All right. And we're going to eventually end up with complex numbers uh, that are solutions. All right. Now, something up here, basically real numbers um, become complex numbers, you know, or complex numbers kind of become imaginary numbers when you're kind of missing one part of the other. So if, you know, your zero, excuse me, your B, or when we're talking about standard form for complex numbers, really, if this number here is a zero, you don't have a complex number anymore. All you're going to have is the real part left. Okay, likewise, if this part right here is zero, you don't have a real part anymore. Okay, you just have the imaginary part. All right, so you can kind of see how A and B being zeros or basically being non existent affect whether or not we have imaginary parts or real parts. Okay, now this is where we're going to kind of put together what we talked about the other day. Normally, what I would do with this, if it says find the zeros, is I would take it because it's in function form to begin with, and I would set it equal to zero. Again, we want to kind of think process here. Normally, I would go ahead with this and I would try to say, hey, I want to try to factor this. Well, the problem you can see already is there's not any factors of 12, um, you know, 3 and 4, 2 and 6, or even 1 and 12, then I can add together that's going to give me 4. So factoring is out the window right away. So the only other method that we've talked about it would be using square root properties, which we know we can't do because of this term right here, all right, and completing the square. So that's my option right here. So what I'm going to do to complete the square is I'm going to take this 12, and I'm going to move it to the other side. I'm going to leave a little space here. Now you can see already on the other side, before in section 4 when we dealt with this, usually all the numbers we put on the other side were positive. Now we're going to have a negative, so you can kind of start to see as this develops how we're going to end up using uh, the whole idea of imaginary numbers and ultimately complex numbers to make this work. So what I want to do on the left here is I want to complete the square. So I'm going to take half of 4, uh, which is 2. We're going to square it, and we're going to get 4. So I add 4 to this side. I have to add 4 to the other side to keep things balanced. All right. Now the whole idea is this is now a perfect square trinomial it should factor as x, in this case, plus half of whatever this number was. Okay, so x plus 2. And on the other side, I get negative 8. All right, I have the squared part of the problem isolated already. It's a quantity, but it's still isolated. So my next step would be square it both sides. So x plus 2 is going to equal plus or minus the square root of negative 8. Now, again, I usually like to wait till the very end to deal with that square root and the negatives and all that stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to subtract the 2 over each side first. And I'm going to go right up here on the top right side what I have. So x is going to equal negative 2 plus or minus the square root of negative 8. Okay, now let's take a look at that um, square root part. First thing I would do 
is I have a negative under the radical, so I'm going to go ahead and pull an I out front, uh, which is supposed to represent the square root of negative 1. So now I can work with the 8 that's there. Okay, next thought process is 8 is actually the square root of 4 times the square root of 2. All right, so next step moving forward here would be negative 2 plus or minus. If I take the square root of that 4, I get 2. So I'm going to go 2i square root of 2. All right, now this is my simplified answer, or it's reduced down as much as it can be. Now you will notice the difference between this and the ones we worked with a little bit earlier is now not only do I have an imaginary part, but I also have a real part. So this is a complex root or a complex solution to this particular problem. All right, now I do want you on your own to go through this next one here. So pause your video, work through this one. You know, we're kind of, like I said, putting everything together here, but I want to make sure that you get a chance to work on one of these on your own. So pause your video, come back, we'll talk about this one again. All right, so again, I'm going to start with, I'm going to take what I have here because it's in function form and I'm going to set it equal to zero. Again, initial thought would be, hey, I want to look to see if I can factor. But again, the problem we're going to run into is my factors, 1 and 18, 6 and 3, 2 and 9, are not going to add together to give me negative 8. So I know that I'm going to have to complete the square as my only option here. So I'm going to subtract that 18 to the other side. Because again, remember, because of this term right here, I can't just use square roots. All right? So if I can't factor and I can't just use a square root property, I have to complete the square. So to complete the square, half of negative 8 would be negative 4. If we square it, we're going to get plus 16. All right, add it to both sides to keep things balanced. Again, I haven't changed anything because I've done the same thing to both sides. All right, this should now factor as x minus, again, whatever half of that number is, 4 squared equals negative 2. All right, square root both sides. x minus 4 equals plus or minus the square root of negative 2. Add the 4. All right, and again, I'm going to move up to the side here where I have a little bit more room. So x is going to equal 4 plus or minus the square root of negative 2. All right, now, this one's a little bit easier to work with because all I'm going to do first is I'm going to get rid of that negative underneath. So write an i out front, which represents, again, my square root of negative 1. And now when I look at what I have left as far as the square root of 2, I can't do anything with that. There's no perfect squares that go into it. It's not a perfect square itself. So basically my complex root or my complex solution is what I have right there. Okay. Again, you're going to have a parabola in the coordinate plane that is not going to intersect the x-axis in any place. Okay. So it has a complex root in this case or a complex zero. All right. Last thing, and this is relatively easy, and um, we're probably not really going to use this until we get to about section 9, like I said later, operations with complex numbers. But uh, basically what we're looking at here is uh, something that's called the complex conjugate. And what we're looking at is at the top here, you will notice that these look very similar in nature to each other. The one difference between them basically being that there uh, is a different sign in front of the complex portion, excuse me, in front of the imaginary portion of the complex number. So imaginary part, imaginary part, different sign, <coughs> excuse me, in front of both. Okay, now what, where this is going to come in handy is because complex numbers, basically uh, that I means that they include a square root, is eventually on down the road. We don't like to have square roots on the bottom of fractions. And if you have a complex number on the bottom of fraction, like I just said, that means that technically you have a uh, radical in the bottom, all right? And we don't want them to be there. So we're going to use the complex conjugate to get rid of those at some point in time. Now, you don't really have to know that for now. All you have to do is be able to identify what a complex conjugate is. So if you have a complex number written like this, the complex conjugate is just found by taking the exact same terms as far as the real and imaginary parts, but changing the sign between the imaginary part. Okay? so. What we're looking at here, and like I said, this is relatively simple, all right? If I have 8 plus 5i, 
the complex conjugate is just 8 minus 5i. All I did is I switched the sign between the imaginary part. Okay, now 6i, I try to confuse you a little bit. Really what this is is like 0 plus 6i. We just don't ever show the 0 part. So the complex conjugate of that would be 0 minus 6i. And again, just remember, you don't have to include that 0. So it would just be like minus 6i. So again, that should be the easiest part of your assignment. All you're doing is you're just switching the signs between what you're originally given and um, what you get for your conjugate, complex conjugate. Switch the signs between the imaginary parts. Okay? You just have to remember the real part, the sign in front of the real part always stays the same. I had a plus 8 up here. It remains a plus 8 on the bottom. You only change the signs between the imaginary parts. All right? And that basically wraps everything up as far as what we wanted to talk about. Okay, so this is a little bit shorter, a little bit more to the point. Again, it should be something that you can take and you can kind of build off of what we talked about in section uh, four and use that to your advantage here a little bit as we talked about the stuff in section five. So hopefully this is a little bit easier for you. Hopefully you took some good notes and you were able to pull out of that presentation uh, what we were looking for as far as some of those key terms at the beginning and hopefully everything makes sense to you.